Imagine that we had a 6x12 chessboard. On one end of it, we have the white king. On the opposite end, we have the black king. This is not going to be a normal game of chess. The black king will stay stationary. Instead, we will take turns moving the white king. That movement is restricted. The white king in every move must go up, right, or upright. In other words, on each turn, we must make progress moving toward the black king. Play continues until one of us lands in that top right corner. That person will capture the black king and will therefore be the winner. Here's the puzzle. You're going first. Design a strategy that guarantees you the victory. And while you think about that, check out some of these cool books that I've written. Your hint for today is that you need to apply backward induction, which is a topic that I cover in Chapter 2 of Game Theory 101, The Complete Textbook. More subtly, this game is equivalent to a variant of NIM, where we have two piles and the ability to remove one object from each pile or one object from both piles on each turn. If you've never seen NIM before, Chapter 2 of Game Theory 101, The Complete Textbook, also covers the most basic version of it. Are you ready for the solution? If not, here's a hint. Your first move of the game will be to take the king to b2. Are you ready now? Let's get to it. And bear in mind that because the king's movement is so slow, this will actually take a long time to unravel. As I said up front, the key to solving this game is to use backward induction. That means thinking about what the end game looks like, figuring out what the good moves are for that end game, and using that information to inform what is good and what is bad earlier in the game. We can start by figuring out where the game ends for sure. K5, K6, and L5 will be the penultimate moves of the game. If you were to land the king in any of those squares, your opponent on the next turn would be able to capture the black king. As a result, we'll shade them in as red. Those red squares mean that if you land on those squares at the end of the turn, you will ultimately lose. This is useful because it helps inform what are good squares to end the turn on. Specifically, think about J6 and L4. Each of those squares only has one legal move that can follow. For J6, that means moving one square to the right. For L4, that means moving one square up. Either way, the next move is obligated to fall on a red square. Thus, if you were to finish your turn by landing on J6, you force your opponent to move to K6, which then allows you to win the game on the next turn. As a result, we're shading in J6 as blue to indicate that it is a square that you want to land on at the end of your turn. It's the same story for L4, where if you land there, it obligates your opponent to go to L5, and then you win the game. As such, L4 is blue, indicating that if you land there at the end of your turn, you automatically win the game. Because J6 and L4 are winning squares, you cannot put yourself in a situation where your opponent would land on them on their next turn. For J6, that means that I5, I6, and J5 are all losing squares. If you placed the king on any of those on your turn, your opponent follows by moving to J6 and therefore will eventually win the game. Likewise, K3, K4, and L3 are losing squares. 
If you finish the turn by putting the king there, you will have your opponent move to L4 on the subsequent move, and you will ultimately lose. Having done that work, can you take the next step backward? In other words, can you find a square that guarantees you the win if you land on it? In fact, based off of the information so far, there are three new ones, h6, j4, and l2. For the two side squares, there's only one legal move your opponent can follow through on, and it's going into the red. j4 is a little bit more complicated because the opponent would then have three legal moves. But each of those legal moves also goes into the red. Thus, all three of those squares are squares that you want to land on to end the turn. If you do it, you win the game. From here, we can mark more losing squares, and you may start to see the pattern. Because h6 is a winning square, these three squares are losing squares. If you finish your turn anywhere there, your opponent would be able to move into h6 afterward, causing you to lose. Because j4 is a winning square, these three squares are losing squares. And because l2 is a winning square, these three squares are losing squares. That information allows us to unlock three new winning squares. f6, h4, and j2. Those then allow us to mark out all of the red squares that surround them. And now the pattern should be clear. The next three squares are winning squares. The squares around them are losing squares. The next three squares are winning squares. The squares around them are losing squares. And now we've narrowed it down a little bit more so that there's only two more winning squares that are still left on the board. But the squares around them are losing squares. And now we've narrowed it down to just a single blue square that remains with the squares around them losing squares. And now we have the solution. On the first turn of the game, you should go to b2. From there, regardless of what your opponent does, you will always be able to navigate back to another blue square, and as long as you continue that process, eventually you will capture the Black King. And that's why backward induction is so great. It takes an otherwise complicated game and simplifies it into digestible chunks which we can readily solve for. And when combined together, each of those chunks eventually gives us the full solution. Did you figure this one out? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Take care.